Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, we will wait one some seconds because the number of attendees is growing very fast. We are now around 60. And then there is more than 100 registered participants. Then congratulations, Claire. You are achieved the maximum number of participants <laughs> that is allowed. And uh, yeah, we will wait uh, just a few seconds more because I can see how the number of attendees is going. Uh, I think that you know that my name is Parabadar. I am the chair of this in-dust cost action that tried to promote the use of dust information not only in research communities, also in user communities. And uh, together with me is Estelle Escazadziz, that is one of the core group members that is in charge of the dissemination activities. And together we will share this session of today that uh, uh, Estelle will introduce our speaker. But I will try to explain a little bit how it's working with this GoToWebinar system if you are not familiar. The important thing is that you have two boxes one is the questions uh, box that this is very important that you use during the webinar. All the questions that you will have, you don't wait until the last minute, please. Just try to start to include your questions during the session, because in that way we can handle better at the end of the speech uh, of the talk of, of our speaker uh, to organize a little bit the, the questions. And you don't hesitate to, to, to use the questions box during the whole webinar. And also you have another box that is the chat box that if you want to write uh, a comment, a general comment for everyone, or you want to use it for uh, exchange any idea, please also use it. And uh, we will take care of the two boxes during the whole webinar. And, uh, and I, I hope that you will enjoy the, the, the talk of our speaker that mm. Estelio will introduce now. Okay, uh, thanks a lot to everybody that uh, participates in this webinar. We are 93 uh, right now. Uh, so today's speaker is uh, Claire Eider. He's going to speak about uh, giant particles. And uh, Claire gained her PhD in 2009 in the University of Reading, Department of Meteorology working with uh, Ellie Highwood on aircraft measurements of dust outflow and deposition to the ocean project. She moved then to the Imperial College for two years, working on urban aerosol measurements, and before returning to Reading to work on the Fennec project uh, on airborne measurements over, uh, of dust over the Sahara. She has worked in, two, in the Samba project, uh, examining the impact of biomass burning aerosols in South American climate. And in 2015, she won the NERC Independence Research Fellowship, studying the role and impact of coarse dust in the climate system. And since 2020, she is an associate professor at the University of Reading. So, Claire, thank you very much. We are very happy to hear you today. Thank you very much, Delios, uh, for the, the kind introduction. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me to give this uh, webinar today. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so as my title slide um, says, I'm going to be talking about uh, giant dust particles um, in the climate system um, and also coarse dust particles. Uh, so moving straight on, I can move my slide. Hopefully you see my next slide now. Um, we all know that dust is important in many ways to the climate and also to the infrastructure, um, as you can see indicated by these nice pictures here. Um, however, one important thing is that almost all these aspects of dust's interaction with climate and impact on um, human infrastructure is that dust size, to some extent, if not to a large extent, um, strongly impacts how, how dust interacts with these features. Uh, so if I show this um, nice plot from Natalie Mayerwald, et al, uh, 2014, you can see how different aspects of the dust size distribution interact with different parts of the climate system. 
Um, so we've got number distribution, surface area distribution and volume distribution. Um, and so, for example, you can see that in terms of interacting with clouds through CCN and ice nuclei, um, the number is important and different parts of the size range are important. Um, and then the larger particles become particularly important um, in terms of contributing to their mass, so interacting with things like the biogeochemical cycles um, and also long wave and short wave AODs. Um, dust size is also important because it can influence um, the altitude um, that dust reaches and therefore the transport distance, which can then go on to impact um, other things such as the distance which dust travels and the extent of its ability to impact different parts of the climate system. Uh, so focusing on the radiation perspective and optical properties, which is particularly what I'm going to be talking about today, um, I've got this um, 1996 very nice um, uh, indicative plots from Tegan and Lassie um, showing how different parts of um, different spectrum um, affect the single scattering albedo on the left and extinction efficiency on the right. So the different types of lines are different sized particles. So for example, in the short wave, um, you can see that as particles get larger, the single scattering albedo drops, so particles become absorbing. Um, this means that the top of atmosphere radiative forcing becomes more positive and you get more atmospheric heating. Um, in the long wave, um, from the plot on the right, you can see that the larger particles um, strongly increase the extinction efficiency and then this increases the long wave um, radiative effect. So a bit about the motivation behind this talk. Um, historically, it's been often been assumed that coarse particles are rapidly deposited. Um, and I think historically, this is why they have not really been included in models. Um, they've also been a challenge um, in terms of measurements, especially airborne measurements. It's very difficult to measure the large particles. Um, and frequently, um, they hadn't been measured at all by aircraft observations. Um, in cases where the course mode was measured, um, there are challenges to measuring that size. So, for example, inlets, um, which you can see um, in some of on the right hand uh, image there, um, reduce the transmission of coarse particles and internal pipe work can also reduce the uh, transmission of the coarse particles before they reach an instrument. And then you can also have uncertainties from different techniques, for example, for example optical scattering techniques um, encounter large uncertainties. However, um, in the last 10 years, um, there's been a lot of progression in airborne dust observations. Um, we've measured larger particles and we've used techniques to avoid inlets and use, avoid using optical techniques. And I'll, I'll talk a bit about more, more about this as the talk goes on. Um, so multiple publications now report the presence of coarse and giant dust particles. Um, so to name a few, um, you can see a nice image of a, a coarse, quartz particle here um, from Van der Duz et al. 2018. Um, this was observed over the Atlantic and long range transport. Um, on the right here, you can see a plot from Weinzier et al. Um, 2017, showing two size distributions in blue. Um, they're showing the size distribution measured over the eastern tropical Atlantic and then in red, uh, the size distribution over the west. Sorry, this is a on timer for some reason. Um, and what you see from that dotted line is um, this is the size where you would not expect any particles larger than that diameter due to gravitational settling. Yet you can see that that size clearly exists in the measurements there. Um, and then more recently, um, some modeling studies, um, this one by Adby and Koch in 2020, um, you can see an observationally constrained size distribution there in the black line and various sets of modeling data in the colored lines. Um, and you can see that at about five microns diameter, the models begin to underestimate the concentration of coarse dust particles. Um, and in this paper, they show that there is four times more coarse dust in the atmosphere than what climate models can simulate. Um, and that this adds a 0.15 watts per square meter um, to global um, radiative um, effect of dust. Um, also, um, a paper by Di Biagio et al. Um, last year in GRL. Um, in this paper, they extended the size beyond 20 microns. Um, and they used updated complex refractive index data. 
um, to calculate the global radiative effect of dust. Um, and you can see from there that um, their global dust direct radiative effect was minus 0.03 watts per square meter. So adding these um, coarser dust particles shift the radiative effect towards a warmer effect. Um, so the aim of this presentation really is to almost to take a step back from these um, more recent publications and go through some of the instrumentation and the observations um, which is, have helped build up this picture and to, to show you how um, coarse dust has been quantified um, through aircraft measurements um, and um, show you how the contribution to optical properties has been quantified. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about um, three different aircraft campaigns um, today. Um, the first of these is the Fennec campaign, which took place um, in June 2011 and 2012. I'll just be talking about the 2011 data. Um, this is going to be split into two parts. So there's observations, as you can see from the flight tracks, over the remote desert in Mali and Mauritania. Um, but since we're also based on the Canary Islands, we've got observations in the Saharan air layer um, at Canary Islands too. Um, when we were flying over the desert, we had a mixture of very fresh dust cases with fresh uplift, um, but also age backgrounds and dust. Um, and then the third campaign I'll be talking about is the Air D campaign. Um, so this was part of the Ice D field campaign in, more recently in August 2015. And this was based at the Cape Verde Islands. And you can see our tracks there in the yellow lines. Um, and if you want to know more about the Fennec and um, the actual flying over the desert, there's a link there to a, a nice movie which shows uh, some fantastic video clips um, and talks about um, what it was like to fly over the desert. Okay, so how did we measure dust? Um, so this is what we used during the Fennec campaign. Um, you can see how our instrumentation there changed as a function of size rate. Um, and on the bottom, you can see some photos of some of the various different instrumentation. So you can see different inlets and you can see um, probes hanging below the wings. So we've got a few different techniques here. Um, We've got in blue um, light scattering techniques. These particular instruments, the PCASP and the CDP on our aircraft are wing mounted. Um, so these use light scattering techniques and they require a conversion of scattered um, light into particle size. And you can see some examples there um, from Rosenberg 2012 of how this depends on the composition of um, particles. Um, so you need to know the refractive index in order to convert um, the measured size into a geometric equivalent size. Um, and this um, can involve large uncertainties. Uh, but the benefits of these two instruments in our case is that they hang from below the wings so they don't suffer from any inlet um, impact. Um, secondly, um, one of the real benefits um, from the Fennec campaign observations is that we had light shadowing instruments, um, optical array probes. Um, so on Fennec, this was a SIP-15, and these are geometric measurements. I'll talk a bit more about the details of these later, um, but they don't require refractive index assumptions, and in this case, they hang below the wings too. Um, and then we also have in-cabin measurements. So here we have nephilometer measuring scattering and PSAP measuring absorption, but these sit behind inlets, so they're then subject to any impacts that the inlets have on the size distribution. And then finally, in the red in the middle there, the real benefit of Fennec is that we had um, a size distribution measured behind the same inlets as leading to the nephilometer in the PSAP, but we also had a low turbulence inlet, which has a very well characterized um, size distribution and losses associated with it. So we could work out exactly what was getting through the inlets um, to our nephilometer and PSAP, which many of the traditional and older measurements of dust were based on. Um, okay, so this is um, kind of what I said on the previous slide. Um, we've, we've got a few different ways to evaluate the losses essentially experienced by our, our Rosemount inlets, which are what you see on the right hand photo just there. Um, and we did a lot of detailed work, um, which I won't go into too much here, um, but it allowed us to quantify exactly what was and wasn't getting through these inlets. Um, and this plot here summarizes what we found. Um, 
so here you can see the enhancement factor or the loss factor of number concentration as a function of size of what gets through these inlets. Um, and that the take home point really is that above about two and a half microns diameter, um, the dust particles or any particles for that matter, we're not getting through the inlet. So if we put all this together, um, this is how the size distributions for FENIC looked um, for cases where we had all our different instruments um, operating efficiently. Um, and as you can see from the plot, we had quite a lot of different instruments. Um, so things to highlight, there are out in the purple on the right hand side, um, we've got the new giant mode observations from our SIP15, the light shadowing data um, showing particles extending out beyond 100 microns. Um, we've got a very good um, extent of agreement between all the different colours or all the different instruments. And um, dropping off in the grey data also circled there, um, this is what we measured and calculated was happening to the size distribution behind our inlets. So you can really see that behind the inlets we're missing a huge amount of the dust size distribution. Um, and so also to point out is that the light shadowing in the purple very much confirms the size distributions measured by the um, optical probes there. So this gives us a lot of confidence that what we're measuring um, is realistic and is, is really what is outside there in the atmosphere. So how does this impact on the optical properties? Well, on the left here, you can see a, um, a frequency distribution of single scattering albedos measured behind the inlet in, a, in our traditional way from the nephilometer in the PSAP. You can see quite high values there, most coming in about 0.97. Um, but we know that these um, measurements are emitting the coarser particles. If we now do the same calculation, taking the size distribution measured, the, the full size distribution which we've measured, and some me scattering calculations with two different refractive indices, which you can see there, um, we get much lower single scattering albedos. Um, so a range of 0.86 to 0.97 for the less absorbing refractive index. Um, so we can see that the rose mount behind the Rosemount Inlet ones are very much an overestimate, um, so that i.e. the warming effect is underestimated based on this. And some simple rotative transfer calculations showed that um, if you emit these coarser particles, um, you get shortwave heating rates um, which are far too low, so they should be two, or two to three times higher by including the coarse particles. Uh, finally, as a sanity check, um, we can do repeat our calculations but adjusting the size distribution for what we know is reaching behind the inlets. And you can see there that this um, frequency plot looks very much like the far left there. So this gives us confidence that um, these calculations are realistic. Uh, so looking at the size a bit more during Fennec in a bit more detail, um, you can see on the top there, we've got number and volume distributions for the campaign average. Um, shown by the three main different instruments which were available and the grey shading is the absolute variability during the campaign. Um, there was quite a lot of variability during Fennec, especially for those larger particles. Um, we see the volume peak at around 20 microns diameter, um, although larger, sometimes much less. On the bottom left, you can see um, the effective diameter versus the single scattering albedo. And during Fennec, we found that the single scattering albedo is extremely strongly controlled by the size distribution. So in the cases where we had very, very large particles, large effective diameter, um, the larger particles particularly dominated at low altitudes. So you can see that from the plot on the right. Um, for beneath one kilometer, um, but we still see effective diameters between about four and 10 microns up to altitudes of about five kilometers through the Saharan re residual layer. Um, so although the absolute giant particles are lowest down, um, the course and getting into the giant mode is still present at higher altitudes, um, which then opens up their potential for long range transport and stronger impacts on the radiation balance. Okay, so, um, that was looking at some of the observations over the desert. Um, we know coarse 
particles are prevalent over the remote Sahara, um, but are they present and to what extent over the Atlantic in the Saharan air layer? Um, so now I'll move on to talk about observations from Phoenix Al over the Canary Islands, um, and also the, after that, observations from Air D. Um, so starting by looking at the impacts of transport on particle size, um, I've, in order to do this, I've estimated dust age since uplift, which is not necessarily straightforward. Um, and the main way, the main technique I've used to do this um, is by using Severi imagery. And you can see an example here um, from a, a later campaign, actually. But you can see that the dust appears bright pink. Um, and as it's transported, um, you can track it um, and therefore estimate the age of the dust since uplift. Um, and this has been categorized for fennec into very fresh haces, which are less than 12 hours old. Um, age, dust over the desert, which is more than 12 hours old, and then all dust at the Canary Islands. Um, so this is how um, the number concentrations look for the different segments of the size distribution at the Canaries from our flights. Um, So you can see that the giant particles are very much mostly present in the fresh cases, and only it was particularly one case um, of the aged events they were present in, which incidentally was um, a haboo. Um, the number of coarse particles um, drops off from fresh to aged and then aged to cell. Um, and generally in the cell, we see very well mixed conditions. Um, so, if you take um, a column average of the size distribution for each of those different categories, um, this is how it looks on the top right here. So we've got desert fresh in the red um, with a very strong coarse and giant mode, desert aged in green where it drops off a little, and then the same thing over the cell, you can see a much larger drop off. Um, and then following um, a plot by Mehring et al from 2003, I've calculated the fractional loss as a function of size, um, Firstly, from fresh to aged dust, which is shown in red, and then aged to cell dust shown in green. Um, and so, for example, you can see that by the time we get to the cell, we're seeing an almost 100% loss of particles larger than about 40 microns. And you can see how that loss changes um, with the various different sizes. Um, interestingly, um, in the course mode, um, we don't see the extent of drop off and loss of particles that we would expect through sedimentation. So, for example, um, a 30 micron particle would be expected to fall five kilometers in 20 hours, and this is not observed. They're still present in the size distribution. So, um, coarse and giant particles are transported further than explained through settling velocity. Um, picking this size distribution apart a little more, um, on the plot on the left, um, the size distributions are coloured by altitude, and then we've got fresh on the top, then age, and then sal at the bottom. Um, so you can see that when the dust is fresh, there's quite a, a difference in altitude of the size distribution, whereas as we move to transported um, in the sal, it's fairly well mixed with altitude. Um, in the fresh cases, um, we see um, we see some difference at about three kilometres, which is the lime green line. So, in the the sort of lower boundary layer of the Sahara, things are suggesting they're quite well mixed. Um, whereas, if we go to the aged category, we saw it see more of a drop off at five kilometres, and this sort of reflects the um, Saharan boundary layer dynamics that we that we know about and understand. Um, and there on the right, you can see some numbers which show um, how the single scattering albedo and the other optical properties um, change for the different categories. Um, so, for example, um, the fresh dust um, at altitudes below 1.5 kilometres is quite a bit more absorbing on average at 0.92 for single scattering albedo compared to 0.95 for the full column um, in the cell. Okay, right, so moving on to the AID campaign. Um, this was our campaign based at Praia in the Cape Verde Islands. Um, on the bottom, you can see um, 
a clip of the MODIS Terra AOD. So we had fairly substantial AODs um, approaching one um, on average throughout the whole period. Um, we had some flights with um, much higher AODs. And you can see um, some references to other publications which go into different aspects of the um, data we kind of collected there. So going back to this plot, which shows um, the different instrumentation over different size ranges here, we had some slightly different instrumentation during uh, D. Um, in particular, in the green, we had um, two instruments um, using light shadowing techniques here. And then inside the aircraft itself, we also had an SP2 and an aerosol mass spectrometer, um, which looked into composition. And then we also have analyzed uh, more filter samples um, offline from AirD, which um, have given us an insight into the shape and composition and also how these change with size. Um, so a little more about the optical array probes. So this covers our SIP-15, SIP-100 and the 2DS. Um, they use light shadowing and you can see an example of the imagery collected on the top right there. Um, and we measure size across the direction of the aircraft motion and also um, across the photodiode array. And in this campaign, we tested out the sizing based on two different approaches. Um, the first was the mean um, dimensions in the X and the Y. So that's the, the direction you can see indicated by the two arrows there. Um, and also that measured by the smallest circumscri circumscribing circle. Um, and neither of these are entirely ideal for non-spherical particles like dust. Um, and because dust is non-spherical, they give us slightly different results. Um, but the benefit is that there is no um, requirement for knowing the refractive index for these calculations. Um, so this is the um, mean size distribution for air D in, up in the Saharan air layer, so not including the marine boundary layer. Um, you can see the PCASP and the CDP in red and pink are the same as we used on previous campaigns, but we now have three different metrics for the, the giant mode there. Um, orange and green are the 2DS using the two different metrics, and then we have the SIP15 in blue. Um, and you can see that there is um, some difference in the return size distribution depending on these assumptions that you make. Um, so going forward, um, we decided to work with the 2DS XY metric, which is shown by the green, um, partly because this was consistent with um, previous work already done from Fennec. Um, and we also know that this measurement returns the lowest um, quantity of giant coarse and giant particles. So um, although it may seem like this data suggests a lot of giant particles, actually it's probably a lower bound um, because the other instruments do suggest more. So um, this is how um, data from our uh, six different flights, yeah, sorry, five different flights during Air D looks um, in the different colours. Each colour is a different flight. Um, the shape of the size distribution in the SAL is somewhat consistent. Um, we just tend to see a rise and a fall depending on the total dust concentrations. Um, if we look to the marine boundary layer, we do see some differences. Um, and particularly in the giant mode, um, we see a mode at around 10 to 80 microns present. So that's the green, the orange and the red there, which is more marked um, when concentrations higher up in the cell are also higher. So indicative that we're seeing some deposition of dust from higher altitudes. And I'll come on to the chemical results later, but our composition results show that this indeed is dust. It's not sea salt. Um, and so finally, um, we fitted log normals um, to smooth out the instrumental noise to some extent and for reproducibility purposes. Yeah, so you can see how the two, the, the SAL and the marine boundary layer distributions contrast to each other. Um, so coming on to the filter sample analysis, um, which has given us composition data and also aspect ratio um, information. Um, you can see an example of a filter sample here, um, and then the black and white um, discrete version. Um, in order to calculate aspect ratios, we fitted ellipses, and this has been done automatically by computer software, fitted ellipses to the outlines of particles and calculated um, equivalent diameters. 
and then the aspect ratio is the ratio of the longest length to the um, perpendicular um, measurement. Um, and so just to highlight that we think dusts are probably platelet-like um, shapes, so they'll probably have a tendency to fall flat onto a filter substrate. Um, so based on that, these filter estimations are probably mean that they're going to be oversized because of their shape. Um, and so, for example, Chu et al. showed that um, they actually measured the height of particles sitting on a filter sample and showed that the height is roughly a third of the length on average. Um, so I've just picked out a few examples to show here, um, which show the aspect ratio distribution. Um, both these cases come from the Saharan air layer, um, and you can see there that the different colours represent different size ranges. Um, so the blue is the smallest particles, and the red and the pink are the larger ones. Um, and that there's some indication that as the particles get larger, they become less, uh, even more non-spherical. Um, the solid black line is what you get from the full distribution, and the dashed line is the um, accumulation mode, less than 2.5 microns. And there's not much difference between these two distributions, and this is mostly because they're based on number, um, and the smaller particles vastly outweigh the larger ones based on number concentration. There's some interesting differences if we look at the marine boundary layer. Um, and in this particular case, we had enough um, giant particles between 10 and 40 microns to add on an extra category, which you can see in the purple here. Um, and there's also an indication here that um, the giant mode are even more non-spherical than the other ones. Um, so moving on to composition, um, I'm showing four different samples here. Um, and for each plot, um, you can see the volume fraction um, for each different um, composition category. So this is based on single particle analysis um, and the dominant composition type has been logged. Um, and it's also split into different size ranges. So you see large differences for the blue, which is 0.1 to 0.5 microns, the smallest particles. Um, there are often quite a lot of sulfates there or sea salt. Um, and then larger than that, the, the composition is fairly similar between the different sizes. Um, they're dominated by aluminosilicates and also a fair proportion of quartz. And then the um, contribution from the minor, more minor um, components variable between each sample. What we do note is that on the right hand side, you can see the fraction of iron rich particles. Um, this relates to the right hand axis. Um, and this is quite variable and can be quite variable as a function of particle size. So sometimes the large particles contain a lot more iron and sometimes they don't. And this goes on to have a strong impact on the refractive index. Um, this also confirms that the giant mode in the marine boundary layer is dust. Um, dust always tends to dominate at larger than 0.5 microns. Um, and finally, the, the solid black dots show the representation for the full size distribution and the black triangle is the accumulation mode only. Um, so I just picked two of these to follow through to our calculations of refractive index, um, which you can see here, both the short wave and long wave. Um, these are based on internal mixing and um, the different volume fractions from the single particle analysis. And you can see that in these two cases, especially in the short wave, um, the largest particles, interestingly, are the most absorbing. So they have a higher imaginary part, which is interesting because it could we know that large particles are more absorbing due to size, but if they also have a different composition, which makes them more absorbing, then their radiative effect could be even stronger. Um, in the long wave, we don't see particularly large differences, um, and the main differences are due to the small particles containing sulfates. Okay, so um, the last part of the talk is um, what I've tried to do is um, can combine data from these three campaigns in a, a kind of useful way um, to give us some overviews on the characteristics of dust as it is transported um, and also to provide something that's useful for modeling comparisons. 
Um, so what I'm showing here is dust mass concentration profiles. Um, each different colour is a different campaign. So orange is fennec over the Sahara, blue is fennec in the Sal, and black is air D in the Sal. And it's separated into um, four different size categories. These are slightly different size categories than what I've talked about so far. So we've got fine dust, less than 2.5 microns, coarse from 2.5 to 10, super coarse, um, 10 to 62.5, and then giant larger than 62.5. Um, so if you start with a giant, we can see that this is only really significant over the desert. Move down to the super coarse, um, and we see a stronger contribution over the desert, but still um, a, a fair amount in terms of mass concentrations um, in the cell and also altitudes. Um, Air D, I should note, had a slightly different size distribution um, with a, a slightly stronger bias towards um, this fine dust and coarse dust um, definitions here. Um, so this is um, the same data, but displayed in a slightly different way. On the left now is the total mass concentration across all size categories um, for each campaign. But then on the right hand side, what you see is the fraction of mass at sizes, firstly larger than five microns in the middle. So this is the size where models are starting to underestimate um, dust concentrations. And then on the right, um, the fraction of mass larger than 20 microns, which is generally the size where models stop, um, including um, they don't include larger sizes than this. So, for example, you can see that over the desert for Fennec Sahara, 92% um, of dust mass is contained at sizes larger than five microns. So, I mean, pretty much all. And if we look at larger than 20 microns, um, there's not much of that in the cell about 2% on average, um, but over the Sahara, 27% um, of the mass is contained in this size range. So a significant amount of being of mass is um, both being completely excluded from models and um, because it's larger than 20 microns or in the size range in which models underestimate the con uh, quantity of dust particles because it's larger than five microns. This is how the uh, three size distributions um, look compared to each other. So going from the desert to um, the cell, we see a substantial loss of giant mode, which we would expect, although some is still there. And we see a shift in the peak um, and size of the volume distribution. And we see some variability in the accumulation mode. Um, so then the next question is, OK, we see these different size distributions, but what's the impact on the optical properties? Uh, so what I've done is I, I've, actually I'll go back, is I, I've taken these size distributions and then gradually incremented the maximum diameter, um, putting each stage through me scattering code in order to calculate the optical properties in, in a size resolved sense. So what you can see from these plots um, on the top for extinction and in the middle on the bottom for absorption is um, the percentage cumulative contribution as size increases to each of these um, metrics. And it's done for each campaign. So the, the colouring is the same again. So we've got um, desert in orange and sal in blue and black. Uh, it seems to be moving on by itself. Um, so, um, for example, um, at 20 microns for the Phoenix Sahara, um, by representing um, only up to 20 microns, um, we capture only 82% of the extinction and only 61% of the absorption. Um, for the cell, we capture pretty much all of it um, by extending the size distribution up to 20 microns. If we instead we look at five microns, um, by only representing up to five microns, um, we capture 41% of the extinction um, over the Sahara. Um, and we capture 50 to 78% of the extinction um, in the cell. So there is an impact on the optical properties through the extinction and the absorption by not representing the full size distribution. Um, I've done the same thing for the long wave spectrum, which you can see here. So um, this includes long wave scattering and absorption together to contribute to the extinction. Um, so you can see that at 20 microns, 
Um, we capture 74% of the long wave extinction um, over the Sahara. Um, and uh, pretty much all close to 100% of the extinction in the long wave uh, in the Saharan LA. Um, if we only um, cover up to five microns, um, we capture far less and you can see the values there. So um, models will significantly underestimate both shortwave and longwave extinction and absorption over the Sahara um, by excluding and also by underestimating coarse dust concentrations. Um, and this in turn will shift the direct radiative effect um, more towards a cooling effect in models if they're excluding these particles. Um, so um, final slide, I think. Um, this plot here attempts to draw together airborne size distributions from a, a wider range of campaigns from the published literature now to look at how size distribution changes with age. Um, so you can see a list of different campaigns there um, in different colours. Um, and this um, plot only includes airborne observations which measured up to at least or larger than 20 microns in diameter. Um, so you can see it's, it's a bit of a spaghetti plot, I'm afraid, but it does show you that there's always a significant contribution from particles larger than five microns and that close to sources, you get a strong contribution from larger than 20 microns diameter. Oh dear, sorry, this doesn't seem to have displayed properly. Um, but it's in my 2019 paper if you want to check it out. Um, what this should show is how the effective diameter changes with dust age for most of the campaigns shown in the figure on the left. Um, and what it shows is that for um, observations less than about one day old since dust was uplifted, we see very, very large particles with large effective diameters of six to 10 microns. And then we see a very rapid drop in effective diameter um, as dust ages until about one and a half days. And then so it drops off kind of exponentially and then it also flattens out after this. And we see little change in effective diameter um, with transport up to about seven days, which is what this plot covers. Um, so that the size distribution really does stabilize, seem to stabilize through long range transport. Um, and we, we don't observe the loss of the coarse particles that we might expect. So in summary, um, we have an improved quantification of coarse and giant dust size distributions, um, firstly through an improved understanding of inlet behavior and um, through the additional use of optical array probes on aircraft. Um, I've shown that there's a substantial coarse mode and um, present in dust and also giant mode over the desert um, and some volume median diameters are listed there. Um, and that this presence of the coarse and giant dust does impact the optical properties. So, for example, over the desert, 39% of the absorption originates from the dust particles larger than 20 microns. Um, and just to highlight that I think um, areas particularly deserving of further research and investigation are the mechanisms and also the sensitivities um, of the coarse and giant particles in terms of how they are uplifted um, and transported and deposited through the atmosphere so that once we understand these things better, we can work on improving um, how we model them and including them in models. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Claire. A very interesting presentation. Uh, we had a, we reached the maximum of the possible that in this 101 so uh, some of the people that would like to attend probably were left out but the, as Sarah has mentioned in the comments the talk it's also recorded and it will be available in the Indust website so if some colleague has uh, problems to connect then he or she can really go there and uh, have a look at the presentation. Uh, it will be available in a few days, hopefully at the end of this week, I'm impatient. Okay, uh, probably we can get straight to the questions, that uh, because we have 15 minutes for these questions and Claire to try to, uh, to answer them. 
So, <laughs> yeah, may I start with some first technical questions? One from Santiago Gasso that uh, asks uh, if uh, the technology for measuring particle size has been improved uh, over the last 10 years, uh, judging from your first results of the first campaign that it was uh, 10 years ago. So if new instruments compared to the old ones can provide some more information on this uh, uh, this measurement. So, so is the question, how, how did the, the data from the last 10 years compare to the older data? If the technology of measuring the particle size has been improved from the first campaign till now. Um, Yeah, so I'm, I'm not quite clear if we're talking about the, the, has the data over the last 10 years that I've been show, showing improved. So I would say um, it's more improved through the inclusion and operation of the additional instrumentation and the work we've done and also other groups have done on inlet um, measurement. And as often happens with aircraft campaigns, it's more more tends to be a case sometimes of which instruments happen to work or break on a campaign, um, and you can have some really bad luck or good luck as things go. Um, and uh, we're very grateful for all the work that people at FAM, so that's the facility for atmospheric airborne measurements, and our different university teams do to keep the instruments functional and get the best out of the instruments. Um, I, I don't know if he's asking about previous campaigns before the ones that I've shown, um, generally they tend to show very few coarse particles. Um, I don't like to pick on particular studies, but um, some of the some papers say, for example, won't co correct for refractive indices. Um, I know cases where there have been large lengths of pipe work used behind inlets. Sometimes it's not very clear from papers that observations have been affected by inlets which um, constrict and reduce the number of coarse particles getting through um, so it can be um, tricky to pick apart the older paper sometimes I hope that answers your question Santiago okay uh, another question from also Santiago Gasso is uh, if uh, the me computation assume well uh, since the mean computation assumes a spherical shape, if uh, the calculations that you use uh, would be more realistic using the non-spherical shapes to compute the single scattering albedo, and he's referring to the first uh, slides you showed about the calculation of the single scattering albedo. Yeah, so my calculations um, are all assume spherical calculations because they use me scattering. Um, for the long wave, this shouldn't be a problem um, because of the wavelength to size um, ratio. It, it probably does affect the calculations in the short wave. Um, and a lot of Jasper Cox group have done calculations, um, similar calculations, but using uh, non-spherical particles. And, and their work shows, and also other work shows that the impact of the coarse particles becomes even greater when you include the non-sphericity. So I think the work that I've showed here is lower bound for the impact of the course mode. Yeah, it is important to include non-sphericity. Okay. Then Slobodan Nikovic is asking, uh, in your opinion, what effects other than gravitational setting you think that models should be the best candidate for including dynamics for particles, for these large particles? So, uh, right, can you say it again, please? <laughs> what effect, other than gravitational setting, you think the models should be the best candidate for including dynamics for the large par larger particles? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> um, there's a there's a lot of talk about um, uh, electrostatic effects and electrostatic charging, and whether that um, impacts deposition and transport, um, particularly how that might vary with composition and with particle size, particularly if there's a difference in composition with size. I, so I think that's um, 
factor that is definitely worth looking at in more detail. And I think um, more investigation of how non sphericity affects deposition rates potentially as a function of size as well could be something to look at. Perhaps asking all models to include electrostatics is <laughs> a step too far. Um, I've got a PhD student who's um, beginning to investigate some of these processes in a model. So and I, I know other groups um, in various places are beginning to look at um, different things here. OK, uh, then Alexandra Tecker from Athens asks, what do you think is the reason for the different size distribution during the Fenex sal and the IRD sal? Uh, that's a good question. Um, the short answer is we don't know. <laughs> the slightly longer answer is that it could possibly be different sources, slightly different sources contributing to um, different sizes. Um, they are different sets of events after all. Um, the, so the main difference between the two is that um, there was more accumulation mode in AirD than in air d cell um, and we, we've speculated on other potential reasons for that which might include the fact that lots of the air d results um, either passed through or very close to cloud and driven by mesoscale convective systems so perhaps that mechanism or process um, impacted the size distributions differently or perhaps it's just um, a measure of the the inherent variability of, of dust size distributions. Okay. Uh, uh, do you have an estimate of how much surface area of dust is missed when excluding excluding larger particles than ten micrometers? Well, surface area. Um, not off the top of my head. Um, it's probably implicit in the calculations I've done, though. So I don't know who that question's from. I could possibly provide that data if they want to contact me. It's a very good participant that is asking how to get the data of this campaign. Ah, OK. Um, so we're working on... Um, a deposit of data to CEDA, which is the UK Centre for Environmental Data. Um, in the meantime, it's probably best to contact me, just email me and I'll point you to um, where some of it is. But I'm, I'm very keen for it to be used and um, shared and applied, so I'm very happy to share it. Okay. Then Africa Barreto from Tenerife asks, uh, since you would like to know about the mechanism of mixing dust from salt to the boundary layer below, considering that inversion, the T inversion is in the interface. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so we didn't explicitly study the mixing between the sal going through to the MBL below. Um, but my knowledge of it is that um, despite the fact that the inversion exists, um, the dust can still be deposited or some fraction of it will still be deposited through the inversion um, and down to the marine boundary layer. Uh, OK, another technical question is how feasible is to use the UAV, a UAV equipment with samplers to collect uh, uh, the sample there. Is it possible? To use UAV to collect samples? Yes. Uh, I guess meaning that uh, similar to your campaign to have yeah. UAVs with samplers in order to have uh, this okay. kind of... So I should start by saying I'm not a UAV expert. Um, I do know that some of this kit is quite heavy, so I expect that's a restriction. Um, yeah, 
I, I have to say I can't really say any more than that but I, I, I suppose in theory it's possible but I think um, perhaps the practicalities may be tricky. Okay. Um, uh, there is uh, oof, there are too many questions now, but uh, um, uh, there is another question from Santiago Vasco that is asking if you can comment on the physical reasons why course more particles remain in suspension so long. I think that is a little bit connected with the question of Nico. And if you think that yeah. the electricity fields could play a role. I, think I didn't hear your last that point. If it, the electrical field could play a role in this, uh, in this remain suspension of the course particles. I think that you already answered by yeah. Nico's question. Yeah, yeah I think so. Uh, there is another question from me and Tin. This is probably a little bit more general, but uh, uh, asks, uh, you said that the dust measurements progressed that avoid inlets and using non-optical techniques, but it seems that most of the data you showed are using in inlets or optical techniques. Uh... So, yeah, I haven't completely omitted using um, the optical, optical techniques, but a large substantial fraction of the size distribution measurements are based on the optical array probes, which are not light, sc light scattering. And through the work we've done with the inlets and the, the various different measurement and observation work we've done, we we now know what the inlets are passing. So it, although we still use observations behind the inlets, we have a better understanding and estimation of what is actually reaching them. So it helps to put their, their measurements in context. Okay, and similarly, is uh, if the size of your measurements uh, geometric or aerodynamic? Um, so none of them are aerodynamic. Um, most of the measurements, the optical array probes start off as an optical diameter and then we convert them to a geometric diameter. Um, and I guess that for the optical array probes, you would probably class that as a geometric diameter. Okay. Uh... And there is a Asterios, last minute question. That is, what is the stem, uh, to what extent is dust in the EM bill from a different source that is mixed down from the sun? Sorry, I'm struggling to hear you, Sarah. Yes. To what extent is dust in the MBL from a different source, for example, transported through the MBL versus mixed down from the sun? I think more or less. You said something before, uh, but okay, that's like yeah, it's a slightly different question, I guess. Um, yes. Yeah, I, I, we do. So we do see different wind direction down in the marine boundary layer compared to the Saharan air layer. So it is possible that um, it's dust transported from a slightly different location. We were quite far out over the ocean when we me took these particular measurements. Um, so my my thoughts are that the marine boundary layer dust comes from the same broad dust outbreak, maybe not the exact same vertical column. And and when we're collecting data with an aircraft anyway, we're we're not just flying up and down in a, a perfect um, column anyway. We're kind of doing doing slanted profiles and horizontal legs. So. Our observations do cover a certain amount of distance anyway by their by their nature. Okay, maybe the last question. Uh, I think I missed that. Uh, from the model perspective, there are three size related parameters: extinction per unit mass, surface per unit mass, and settling velocity. How those are related to the sizes that can be measured experimentally? 
Okay. <laughs> um, yes. Well, uh, so was it a surf, surface area? What were the other ones? Extinction per, per unit mass, mm -hmm. surface per unit mass, and settling velocity. So. Okay. So yeah. surface area, um, we calculate from number concentration. Um, so that's almost a direct measurement if, if you have it. Um, the mass extinction, um, we typically calculate that either by measuring the size distribution and doing some scattering calculations or by some combination of internal aircraft measurements of scattering and or absorption to get to extinction. Um, and sometimes we can do something like combine that with the, the mass measured from the filter samples to get a mass extinction efficiency um, or, or by a dust density um, to convert it from our directly from our scattering observations um, to their measurements that we can get. The settling velocity is measured. That's something that we'd um, purely calculate, guess, estimate. Okay, maybe I have to stop here because yeah, we, yeah, it's yeah, we are just in the hour. Too close. Thanks a lot yeah, for your time and for the nice presentation. I think that, yeah, you are now in the top of the most popular webinars that we started this year. We'll see if someone can smash your record of 101 <laughs> participants. And Estelius was sharing the screen because our next speaker in two weeks, of, of course, uh, we will pass all the questions to, to Claire after the event because we are recording it and also the list of participants and uh, there is a question that wants that invite you to submit an abstract in the European Aerosol Conference just for your input and the next speaker that we will have in two weeks 7th April is Antonis Svika that uh, he published recently a paper that is funded by INDAS about a new database based on the satellite data and producing a specific data set that is in DAS. And it will be the talk of, of the next webinar that will be in two weeks in the same place, same hour. Then I hope that all of you will join us. And I don't know, Estelios, Claire, do you want to add anything else? Because it's four o'clock. And we will try to keep British, uh, yes. Just to thank you very much, Claire, again for a very interesting presentation on a subject that is really, <laughs> really hot for the community, let's say. And uh, hope to see you all uh, in two weeks for some more uh, present with another presentation with uh, satellite based uh, dust measurements. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>